So welcome, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Julien Labruyere. I am uh, one of the directors at VetCT, and um, here is our 12 minutes take home webinars. So it's great to see so many of, of you here. Just a few words of housekeeping before we start. If you haven't had yet a chance to try the, the VetCT app, please remember you can register a free trial for just download the app and create an account or contact uh, the team at sales at vet-city.com and we will very be very happy to help. Um, the VetCT apps will give you a 24-7 access from your mobile phone to a team of friendly specialists across all specialties and you can choose to communicate with a specialist with instant callback, text chat, or you can book an appointment at a time that suits you, um, or you can ask for a written report. And whilst you are learning on each case, anyone in the UK will also get um, a CPD certificate. So on to today's 12 minutes webinar, as a reminder, the session itself is being recorded and there will be an opportunity to ask a few questions at the end. So please do add any questions into the Q&A section of the webinar rather than the chat function, but we will check both. We will answer as many as we can and obviously um, you know, take other questions after the webinar if we don't have the time. So um, we should have a slide presenting the team. Maybe an IQ. You... If you put uh, your presentation on screen, or oh, have you done that already? Yep, yep, should be there. Oh, you should be there. Okay, because mm -hmm. I can't. Uh... I can't see it for, for for any reason, but that's not a problem. So it's my great pleasure to uh, to introduce um, Dr. Anna Nemec um, today. Anna is a, is a diplomat in uh, dentistry and uh, oral surgery. She's uh, an amazing clinician with a, a huge amount of knowledge in the subject. And I can promise that uh, you are here for a treat, a 12 minute treat, in fact, about dental okay. trauma. So, um, Anna, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julien, so much for the kind introduction and for having me on, on board. Um, and welcome everyone to our dentistry world. So what we will talk um, in these 12 minutes um, or what I will focus on is two things that we wanna know. One is how we really comprehensively evaluate a, a tooth that sustained trauma. And second, what do we do about that tooth once we diagnosed what is uh, wrong with it? So when we are talking about, basically today we are talking about the inside of the tooth. So about endodontic system. Uh, and we should not only think in terms of dental pulp when we talk about endodontic system, because if we look on the histological image on the right side of the slide, we can see that the pulp, which is on the left side of the image, and dentin, which is the pink structure on the right side of the image, are very intimately connected. We are basically talking about pulpodentin complex. Um, and odontoblasts, which are the outermost layer, cellular layer of dental part, are actually producing predentin, which is the bright pink material, which then mineralizes into dentin. And dentin is tubular structure. So we can imagine about dentin as a sponge. So whenever dentinal tubules are exposed to the environment, we need to think that pulp is actually involved as well, because in every dentinal tubule, there is actually an odontoblastic process. So they really are uh, connected. Um, then how much of the trauma the dentinal, the, the odontoblast and the pulp will sustain depends on how much of dentin remains above the dental pulp. And by saying this, this will actually be also connected to our last slide of the lecture when we will talk about uncomplicated uh, fractures of the teeth. So mentioning uncomplicated fracture, this brings me to the next slide, 
which is, um, which is an overview of diagnosis that we give to traumatized teeth. And this is um, an AVDC, so American Veterinary Dental College classification. Um, and the, this, the most simple trauma that the tooth can sustain is actually that that damages the enamel. It can be so-called enamel infraction, which are actually little, uh, little cracks in the enamel, or it can also be an enamel fracture. Have in mind that already by these two fractures, we are dealing with exposed dentinal tubules. It's very minimal, but still we need to we need to think, okay, we are now losing the protective layer of enamel, thus exposing the dentin, and therefore also getting access, or the my, micro, my, uh, microbials also getting access to the dental pulp. Uh, if we are talking about uncomplicated crown fracture, that would mean that we are having uh, involved uh, dentin, enamel, but dental pulp is not directly exposed. On the other hand, when we are talking about complicating, complicated crown fracture, that will mean that enamel and dentin are, are involved, but there is a direct exposure of dental pulp as well. Similar applies to fractures that are not involving only the crown, but also the root. So if we are talking about uncomplicated crown root fracture, then uh, enamel, cementum, and dentin are involved, but dental pulp is not exposed. Complicated crown fracture means that um, cementum, enamel, dentin, and pulp are involved. And then the last one is root fracture, which is mostly uh, detected only on radiographs. Um, and many times the tooth is just slightly mobile on our clinical examination. So this brings me to the next slide. So how do we properly evaluate um, every tooth that has sustained trauma? Definitely our clinical examination, which can be to a limited extent done in an awake patient, will give us some hints. For example, in this cat here on the left side, we see that the crown is part of the crown is missing. That's definitely uh, one of the signs. Then be very, very um, careful about the um, gingival, um, uh, mucogingival junction. So this is the line between the gum and mucosa, because that is the area where sometimes we will see little pimples and those can be draining tracts from an infected tooth. And we can see it here. We have a fractured maxillary fourth premolar tooth and very typical location of a draining tract here where also a foreign body actually got stuck. Then don't forget about these color teeth, like in this second incisor here, 92% of discolored teeth are non-vital. However, today we are not talking about those, but just have them in mind, discolored teeth are mostly non-vital. Then if we go on, the signs may become a bit more subtle. If we look at this dog, she was presented with uh, pretty nice uh, teeth, very healthy oral cavity, apart the fact that there was much more dental deposits on the left side of the mouth compared to the right. This makes us think that this dog is actually not chewing so much on the left side, meaning that probably something is painful or makes, uh, makes her chewing on, on this side uh, uncomfortable. And indeed, once we evaluate the teeth, we actually found out that the dog had two fractured teeth on the left lower jaw. And definitely when we are talking about behavior, this is a very, very uh, important, um, um, important aspect to actually clarify with the client because majority of the oral pain will not be very obvious, but it will show as um, changes in behavior. So always ask the client about changes in eating habits, toys, playing with toys habits, um, any other changes in terms of mastication, comfort when they are touched around their head. They, they will very rarely show obvious signs of oral discomfort and have in mind that not eating is very, very, very rarely a sign of oral pain. If the animal, dog or a cat is not eating, probably there is something else going on rather than the oral cavity. 
but definitely a clinical examination of an awake patient is not enough. So we always need to recommend to the client to have their pet examined under general anesthesia. Once they are under general anesthesia, we will examine every single tooth and we will definitely look for other for different periodontal findings and so on. But when we are talking about dental trauma, it's very easy. We will just use Dental Explorer, run it over damaged tooth and see if we can access dental pulp or not. And this is our clinical sign. If we can access dental pulp that or, or the pulp cavity, that means that there is a complicated fracture and it needs to be addressed as we will shortly talk. However, also clinical examination under general anesthesia is not enough. We know that without doing dental radiographs, we will miss about a third of, a third of pathology in dogs and almost 50% of pathology in cats. This means that if we will clinically diagnose after careful examination under general anesthesia, if we will uh, diagnose a tooth as healthy, but not taking radiograph we have great chance that we will miss pathology in this tooth. Um, so dental radiographs are still a gold standard and they should be um, employed in working up dental patients. So when we are looking for endodontic pathology, there are four signs that we should look for on our dental radiographs. The first sign is actually integrity of the crown, which is combined with our clinical finding and also and or integrity of the root, if we are talking about root fracture. So that's number one. Second one is the width of the pulp cavity. So if we look at this fractured right mandibular canine tooth in this cat, we can see that the pulp is slightly larger compared to the intact tooth on the left. And that actually means that the pulp cavity failed to narrow because odontoblasts died and uh, they are not laying down dentin anymore, which is a normal process during aging of the, of the tooth. The third sign is the, uh, is the width of the periodontal ligament space ap apically or integrity of the uh, periapical bone. We can clearly see on the left side, we can nicely follow lamina lucida all around the tooth. Lamina lucida is actually periodontal ligament space and it's nicely, nicely following the root. If we look on the affected right canine tooth, we can kind of follow it and then we definitely lose it somewhere at the apical area. Um, that, that is a sign of, of um, an widened periapical um, periodontal ligament space. And then the fourth sign is the integrity of the apex. So the, the affected tooth in this case appears shorter compared to the normal healthy tooth. And the reason for this is inflammatory root resorption. So these are the four signs that we shall look on our dental radiographs. If only one sign is seen, we need to address, we need to treat that tooth. However, we need to have in mind that dental radiographs have a limit of detection. So there may be no radiographic changes associated with a fractured tooth. And that is especially common if we are dealing with acute abscisation, for example, or with a very recent fracture. Those are not showing up on radiographs. In these cases, we should consider advanced imaging. So um, both CT and cone beam CT both has been shown to be superior to dental radiographs expected. Um, CT um, should actually be really reserved for cases that are definitely ambiguous, uh, where we really are highly, uh, high, we highly suspect endodontic disease, but we can't see it either clinically or, endo, or on dental radiographs, or where we may think that actually a swelling is not actually dental disease related, but it may be a neoplasia. Those are definitely the cases that, um, that should, be, uh, should be transferred to, to have a CT. Uh, cone beam CT, on the other hand, um, is more widely employed and it's, uh, it's coming, it's coming uh, uh, a lot into veterinary dentistry from human dentistry. Um, and it's definitely, again, superior compared to dental radiographs. However, if we look on the human side, cone beam CT, because it still has more radiation compared to dental radiographs, 
um, should not really be routinely used for diagnosing of all patients, but definitely should be used, for example, in brachycephalic breeds, uh, that's for sure, and for cases that are ambiguous or unclear once we obtain dental radiographs. So what now? Now we have diagnosed our tooth um, with a problem. Uh, what shall we do now with it? Uh, the first rule is if dental pulp is exposed, so if we are dealing with a complicated fracture, the tooth must be treated. Um, and why the tooth has to be treated uh, is because if the tooth has exposed dental pulp, directly exposed dental pulp, there is it will inevitably become infected. So in, in, very, in, in first few hours post exposure of the dental pulp, there will be hemorrhage like in any other wounds. Then we will be dealing with acute localized pulpitis. And it has been shown in a, in a, um, in a research setting um, that uh, in, about, in, in, in up to three days, about three millimeters of uh, most coronal portion of the pulp is inflamed. Later inflammation uh, affects majority of the dental pulp. And the problem with inflammation of the dental pulp is that because it's encased in a, in a tooth, it can't really swell or it swells, but it's, it's on the account of blood vessels um, shrinkage. Um, and that, that, uh, that actually impairs the blood flow in the dental pulp, uh, making it prone to uh, necrosis. Plus, obviously, we have a direct entry for all the microorganisms. Uh, pulpitis will develop uh, in dogs and cats, or pulpitis and pulp necrosis will develop in dogs and cats within two to three months post-dental expo post pulp exposure. Even before the dental pulp becomes completely necrotic, we already have spread of infection and inflammation into the periapical tissues. It has been shown that apical uh, periodontitis develops within a month in dogs and cats. Um, so we have two reasons now here why we need to treat the tooth. First of all, it's painful. Inflammation of pulp as well as inflammation of periapical tissues is very painful. So we need to treat that. The other thing is, constant um, constant focus of infection. So that's why we need treatment. How shall we treat it? Again, we have two basic options. One is extraction and the other is endodontic treatment. Now, extraction should always be performed for fractured deciduous teeth. We can see in this puppy that we have a fractured tooth, it's um, discolored, we also see draining tracts on the mucogingival junction, definitely non-vital infected tooth. It needs to come out. It needs to come out for two reasons. One is because it's painful and infected. The other reason is if we leave it in, we may have this chronic, we will have this chronic ongoing inflammation infection, which may affect development of the permanent uh, tooth bud. When we are extracting the deciduous teeth, we will always recommend doing a surgical open approach to extraction for two reasons. One is to make sure visualizing under magnifi with magnification loops that we are actually removing all the remnants because sometimes radiographs can be very difficult to interpret because of all of the overlapping structures. And the other reasons why we the other reason why we want to have an um, open extraction is because we want to make sure that we are not damaging the developing permanent tooth bud. Other uh, uh, situations or cases where we will extract the, the uh, um, traumatized tooth are um, permanent teeth with severe damage. For example, complicated crown root fractures with deep, deep root component or root fractures, majority of them, or teeth that have, um, uh, that have been um, non-vital and inflamed for so long that changes uh, like here, inflammatory root resorption is so severe uh, that performing standard normal grade root canal treatment would be impossible. I'm not saying that there is no treatment possibility nowadays for, for such teeth, but definitely they are either complicated or they are uh, still in research phase, for example, regenerative techniques. They exist, we know about them, but they're certainly not, uh, not yet um, known treatments for, for the problem. On the other hand, I said we have also endodontic treatments. So 
the first type of endodontic treatment is vital pulpectomy. Uh, with vital pulpectomy, we will only amputate those millimeters, coronal millimeters of inflamed and infected pulp, meaning that this procedure will have good results, will give good results only if performed um, very soon after the, the trauma uh, happened. Uh, generally, we are talking about 48 hours, uh, and we know that uh, within 40, treatment within 48 hours will give about 80% success, even more with newer materials. Um, and we also know that in young animals with immature teeth, with an open apex, we may prolong this treatment or we may, we, we may postpone this treatment because actually we don't really have much other options. But generally, vital pulpectomy is an emergency in dentistry and it should be performed within 48 hours. On top of that, we need to monitor that too. So we see here, I performed this um, within 48 hours. We can see um, the, the material that was placed on the pulp. And then we have these two materials that are our restoration. This is recheck in six months. And what we are looking at is that the pulp cavity continues to narrow down, which it does, and that no apical disease is forming, which is not. And this is the same case five years later. We still can see that there is normal tooth development without any periapical disease. So that is a successful treatment. So within 48 hours, radiographic recheck is a must. Root canal treatment, however, can be performed also later in course. Uh, it is more technically challenging. Uh, it requires also more, more uh, instruments and materials. Uh, but definitely highly successful treatment, about 80% success rate in cats and about 90% um, in dogs. So highly recommended, especially for strategic teeth, which are most commonly fractured. However, when we talk about endodontic treatment, especially about root canal treatment, especially about more involved types of root canal treatment, such as retrograde, or as I mentioned before, um, plug treatments or so on, um, definitely those would need um, experience, materials, instruments, and may you may need to consider um, uh, refer. Um, but have in mind that uh, what, what, what the limitations on the treatments are. So if you have a dog or a cat with a severely damaged tooth, then there is no point in referring for endodontic treatment because it may not be treated um, in some instances anyway. Uh, and definitely any time that we do or we do endodontic treatment, we really want a client, uh, we really want that the client commits to at least one recheck, preferably or by the book, there should be yearly rechecks up to five years, which is quite a lot of anesthesia, but at least one recheck is, in my opinion, a must. Um, and in my, in my experience, if the client does not commit to it, then I would rather extract the tooth um, compared to do an endodontic treatment. And then finally, to complete the lecture, we are coming to uh, teeth uh, with uncomplicated fractures. So those teeth where pulp is not directly exposed, but we have exposure of dentinal tubules. Recent study uh, has shown that um, about a quarter of cases uh, of fractured fourth premolars, like in this picture, um, that don't have pulp exposure uh, are non-vital. So the, the, uh, the amount of, of, uh, of microorganisms or the amount of irritation to the dental pulp is so severe, even in cases where um, dental pulp is not directly involved, that about a quarter of the tooth will uh, develop necrosis of the dental pulp. And in this case, we can see that the pulp is not involved. This, this, um, this little dot here is actually not a pulp. Uh, it was... Uh, uh, it, it was just some staining, but we can already see here this little pimple. So that is the draining tract or forming draining tract on the mucogingival junction, which already tells us that this tooth is infected, that it is non-vital. Um, and again, even, even uh, cracks in the enamel, or this was more than enamel, but there was no pulp exposure, Teeth with such trauma need to be examined in detail and also dental radiographs performed. This is one of my recent cases. Um, as I said, we see here uh, an uncomplicated crown root fracture. 
Um, but as I said, Pop was not involved. I couldn't probe it. Taking dental radiographs, we can see clearly two so-called well-defined periapical lesions. We can also see some condensing osteitis here on the mesial root of the tooth, uh, which, um, which is indicative of a very chronic process. So again, such tooth is probably, more, uh, is probably a candidate for an extraction, mostly because of the root component here, not so much because of the periapical lesion, because also have in mind that if we have periapical lesion, especially in dogs, it's not a contraindication for an endodontic treatment. Actually, if we treat a tooth with periapical lesion and then follow it radiographically down the line, and we see shrinkage of, um, or disappearance even, of um, periapical lesion that definitely shows us that our treatment has been a success. Uh, if the fracture, an uncomplicated fracture of the tooth is recent, uh, then we would still um, recommend some minimal treatment. Um, and I, what I would usually recommend, and recent is, is not really a defined, a defined piece of time. Um, recent fracture would probably say within two weeks or so. Um, in these cases, I would perform odontoplasty and then repair it with a bonded resin to, um, to seal dentinal tubules and therefore prevent sensitivity of the tooth as well as um, leakage of, um, through the dentinal tubules. Uh, depends on the, on the nature of the fracture. This may be all. I may decide for restoration, depends on how the fracture looks. If there is, in the, if there is near pulp exposure, and near pulp exposure means that there is less than 0.5 millimeters of denting covering the pulp. Clinically, we see pulp kind of shining through the dentin. That's near pulp exposure. Those should actually be addressed as um, exposed pulp. And we would do uh, pulp capping there. Uh, any tooth that has sustained trauma, even if the pulp is not exposed, even if it's recent and we uh, treat it with, uh, with, uh, with this minimal treatment, uh, they should be actually uh, followed up with radiographic, uh, radiographic readings. So all in all, uh, if we look at our, if we, if we look at this, our uh, little flowchart of how to address um, fractured teeth or teeth that's a strange trauma, wait and see is definitely rarely justifiable, and um, at least uh, careful examination with dental radiographs should be performed. And with this, I would like to thank you all again. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was a brilliant presentation, you know, very, um, uh, very practical uh, and, and well illustrated. So um, thank you very much. So I'm going to open the floor for questions now. Um, please use the, the Q&A button that you will see bottom right of your screen. And, um, you know, feel free to, um, to ask any question to, to Anna, who will stay there for, for a few more minutes. Maybe I can I, I can ask one. When when uh, when you perform tooth extraction, um, Anna, would you recommend to um, and in case of a periapical abscess, would you recommend to culture um, and 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 put the animal and, uh, on antibiotics or or not? Thank you for this one because antibiotic use in dentistry is an extremely important topic, and it could be you know a lecture or two or three. <laughs> Another hour. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no. Uh, we would rarely use antibiotics perioperatively and postoperatively in these cases, um, and we would only use perioperatively antibiotics in cases where um, there is pyrexia or, or increased uh, white blood cell count, so showing systemic signs, which is extremely rare with oral disease, otherwise not. Um, so therefore, I would not um, recommend routinely um, culturing because we would usually not even use antibiotics. The only thing is if there is some sort of, and I've seen it really very, very rarely, if there is an acute abscisation where a dog 
I've seen in the dogs acutely develop swelling of the entire half half of the head. That that's definitely a bit different than yes, than I would I would recommend culturing and using antibiotics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one question we had. Um, if we don't know when fracture happened, can we still recommend endodontic treatment? Um, that's exactly the point of the endodontic treatment. So if we don't know when, and I'm talking about root canal treatment, so full pulpectomy. The point of full pulpectomy is that it should be performed on the teeth that um, sustained trauma at an unknown point, definitely more than 48 hours. Um, you know, they noticed it, you know, it was not in the, in the last 48 hours. Um, and then that, that is the first rule. The second rule is what we see on the radiographs. If damage due to long-standing infection, inflammatory root resorption is there that may prevent us from doing normal grade root canal treatment. Um, and other, th other than that, um, total pulpectomy or full root canal treatment is, is meant exactly for such cases. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? So you can use uh, the Q&A button to, to ask a question or the chat. Yes, we have another one. When you have an uncomplicated fracture in a canine tooth in cat and you don't know when it happened, would you consider root canal therapies? Very similar question. Yeah, it's very similar question, uh, though um, it may be a bit different in dogs and in cats. Um, there are two studies out in cats. One is saying that if there is pre-existing inflammatory root resorption in cats, it will lead to failure anyway. So uh, that's one study. The other study, the, 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 the researchers did not obs observe that. Both were clinical studies. So in cats, um, if there are no radiographic signs of uh, pre-existent um, external inflammatory root resorption, I would definitely treat it endodontically if the client elected so. Uh, if there are signs of inflammatory root resorption, even if it's very mild, I would, I would, I would definitely discuss that well with the client. If resorption is severe, I would, I would probably not treat that. I would not recommend treating that too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Dogs is different. In dogs, in dogs, they 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 respond much better. Okay, fantastic. I think I think we don't have any any more questions. So I just wanted to, to say a big thank you, Anna, for um, for your presentation. Thank everyone for attending. Great attendance uh, uh, tonight. Uh, we we hope that you found the webinar interesting, informative. You know, with plenty of practical tips that you can take back into your practices. Um, please do keep an eye for um, any future session. Our next session, uh, we will be running a, a webinar on how do I confirm the diagnosis of FIP, and that will be done by uh, Kate Murphy. So, um, you know, please keep an eye and, and, and do register. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available on our website uh, and YouTube shortly. And, and finally, um, don't forget to, to download the app. If you don't have it, uh, give it a go. Uh, create an account. Um, we will leave the screen up for a few seconds so you have time to scan the QR code. So if you have any question, uh, you can also reach us directly at sales at vet-ct.com. Uh, thank you very much and we look forward to seeing you all again next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>